All right, Grant Hacker, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Hawkey. How are you? Good. Now, where are you coming from today? Where are, where are you at? So, I'm just in my office, actually, in Melbourne. So, uh, I run a business down here. I'm, I'm mainly working remotely at the moment. But, um, yeah, live in Melbourne, right next to the city. So, I walk in quite a bit and uh, come into the office, get a bit of work done here. Yeah. yeah. Now, how long have you been based in Melbourne now? Uh, I've been here, what is it, 2017. So, I, uh, I finished off my swimming career in Melbourne, probably the last 18 months of my career. And then... I uh, lived here for seven years, moved up to Sydney, back up to the Gold Coast, then came back down here in 2017. So my kids from my, my first marriage are down here. So it was good to come back oh, down yeah. here and spend time with them. Nice. Now, you have twins, right? I do. I do. You know <coughs> How old are they now? That. Yeah. They're 10. So they turn 11 this year in September. So that uh, goes awfully quick. What about yours? How old yeah, are you two? Yeah, I got twins uh, and they're, they're turning 12 in June. So I had them just before you. But that's crazy. We both had twins, huh? Yeah, yeah. I know you were going for a third and, and hesitating at that stage. Then all of a sudden mm. you got two for the class of one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a double whammy. We must have had the same yeah. drink or something. You know, I don't know what we're... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. We were in the water that night. You don't have twins in the family, do you? No, no. no. no that was a, a little bit by chance. So we had a little boy, yeah. little girl. And yeah. um, with my fiance, we just had a, a little boy. So we've got a three and a half month old at home now. So we've got quite, quite, a, quite a broad oh, wow. spectrum. That's awesome, yeah. mate. I love it. What's his name? Edward. Edward. New one. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Beautiful, mate. Well, listen, I uh, appreciate you spending some time with us, mate. There are so many people that have reached out to me like, you've got to talk to Grant Hackett. And, uh, and luckily enough, I said, yeah, I know that guy. So, uh, you know, we might be able to have a chat. So, <laughs> We're um, on a team for 10 years together. So. Yeah, we traveled the world together. <laughs> How did how did the 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 fifty freestyler end up being good mates with the fifteen hundred freestyler mate? How'd that work out? Sometimes opposites just attract Hawkey. You know that <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. I mean, I always loved you. I had so much respect for you. I, you were, you know, I think I think sometimes with distance swimmers, it can be a little numbing in the mind. But you're always sharp, mate. You're always so funny. You're always switched on, and uh, you're just you're just different. All of, from the moment I met you, were a different cat, you know, and. Uh, it's no surprise to me that you were so successful over so many years. And I've got, I've got so many uh, funny Grant Hackett stories and some, some good behind the scenes ones. But I'm, sure, I'm sure you've got a couple, but uh, I'd love to get into a couple of those today, but mate, like, so, so normally with my podcasts, I go in, I talk about people's, um, you know, how they started swimming and how they progressed through swimming. And, and, and that's been cool up to this point, but I've done about 35 of those now. So I'm kind of a, a little bored of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to switch it up a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, mate, you were just dominant. And I know that it meant a lot to you. You know, your dominance meant a lot to you. And the way that you performed meant a lot to you. And winning meant a lot to you. So, let's just get into that. Why was that so important to you over a long period of time? I don't know, to, to, be, to be brutally honest. I think, um, for me, my brother was six and a half years older than me. So, I was always very competitive against him because he was so good at sport and mm. so admired for that. So, I think... A lot of my drive came from wanting to try and be as good as, as him. And then also watching Kieran Perkins as I was growing up, mm. um, you know, win Olympics, break world record after world record. So I think I was inspired by quite a few different athletes. But for me, I was always deeply competitive. Um, my mum tells this embarrassing story because I was quite a relaxed sort of character. I mean, similar to yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons we get along so well. But I... Um, I did a swimming race when I was five and, and I won by about 10 or 15 meters. And then I touched the wall and I yelled out, did I win? And everyone in the whole swimming complex heard it. And I think my mum, you know, sort of crept back into the bushes because she was a little <laughs> bit embarrassed. And she was like, where did that come from? She goes, I didn't even realize that you had that deep competitive drive. So I'm not sure how much of it's nurture versus nature, but um, for me, I've always loved winning. I've always loved challenging myself. And I think that's what I really liked about distance swimming. I liked trying a new set, put, seeing how hard I could push myself, seeing how close I could get to that edge. Um, and I loved destroying the competition. Like I, I really always had this thought, even when I was a teenager, make them race for second, make them race for second. And in the 1500, you're lucky enough in a strategic sense that you can do that. And if you're willing to go out hard enough and challenge yourself, you can break the back very early of the other competitors. And, and I think for me, 
um, seeing Kieran Perkins do that a lot through his career, I just kept, at first when I started doing that, I used to die. When I was a younger athlete, when I used to try that strategy, it wasn't always perfect. It was like Michael Phelps going 15 meters uh, off every wall at, in a 400 IM. I mean, at first that doesn't work, but if you keep trying, it does eventually work and you get fit enough and dominant enough, dominant, uh, enough to be able to do it. So for me, um, I just loved racing. I loved winning, but I really liked challenging myself and seeing how fast and how far I could go. And um, I just loved the competitive nature of what we did. And also, when I came down to the shorter events, which I didn't predominantly train for, I got to compete against Ian Thorpe. Mm -hmm. And I think I really wanted to beat him a lot of the time because he was just so good. I mean, his times would still be smashing people today. Like they were from 20 years ago, from when he was 16. I mean, yeah. people forget that Ian Thorpe when he was 16 and a pair of little swimmers swam 341 for 400 meter freestyle at Homebush at Pampax in 1999. Mm. Wow. Like he, he was that phenomenal. And um, so to have someone of, I guess, his um, dominance and, um, you know, just his ability to be able to perform consistently and at that level um, was great for me because it always sharpened me. It always got the best out of me for my 1500 as well. Yeah. Man, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, they talk about once in a generation type swimmers and we were in an era where we had a few more than that, to be quite honest. You know, we had yeah. um, Kieran Perkins, obviously, who's, who came along and was just, uh, he set the standard, he set the bar and changed the game for everybody. I mean, he was the first millionaire swimmer and, and I think that paved the way for you to, to do what you did and, and make the money that you made and, and be the superstar. And, and so we, we all learn a lot from, from Kieran. But then you were around the same, you, you know, you're exactly the same time as, as Ian Thorpe, you know, and then you were there with Michael Klim and then you were there with Jeff Hugel. And like, so there's these superstar athletes um, that we all had at the same time. But in terms of just Kieran Perkins, um, you know, Ian Thorpe and Grant Hackett, did you, did you, know at the time like did you know that like this is a pretty unusual era to be in with just how dominant you guys were i i knew it was special definitely um i think for me what i saw from kieran perkins and and when i say this this is probably thoughts that i have around the age of 14 13 or 14 i remember australia always been so dominant at the commonwealth games but then going to world championships or olympics we'd be lucky to to win one maybe two gold medals you know yeah. the, the whole dynamic change but the thing with kieran perkins it wasn't like that he could go anywhere and be dominant mm. and i felt like then we could produce athletes that were, were dominant um, globally not not just in certain regions um so he gives you that sense of belief and that's what i got from from kieran as i was growing up and watching him compete um when i was around ian i knew there was something super special there because he was just so phenomenal I remember when we competed in Fukuoka in Japan uh, at the Pan Pacific Championships in 1997. I'd just turned 17. He was 14 years of age. And I, I touched the wall for the 400 meter freestyle. And I, I think I went 347.2. And I think it would have won the Olympics a year before, which Daniel Loder, um, the Kiwi, mm. won the 400 meter freestyle in Atlanta. And I turned around and I didn't even stay focused on my time, which was a PB for, for too long because I saw who was in second and I saw three minutes, 49 thought. And I was like, three minutes, 49 mm. He's 14. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on there? Yeah. He broke the Australian record. I think it was Ron McKean's 20 year old. So it was a phenomenal record of four Oh seven. He broke it by 18 seconds. Mm. That's how much he followed that mark. So, you know, after seeing that, but then the thing was, it was every time we competed, we improved. So, you know, we, we got a, you know, a certain sort of milestone at that particular meet, but then a few months later, we'd go a little bit faster. Then the next year we'd go to world championships and finish first and second there and go 346 low. He was 15, I was 17. We'd then go to Commonwealth Games trial. He would break Duncan Armstrong's. Um, 147.25, which he beat Matt Biondi um, with in 1988 to win the Olympics. Thought he broke that as a 15-year-old. And then he went 146 yeah. a few months later at Tom Games, and then we both went 344 together. So it was kind of just like, wow, you can do that. We'll do this. We'll do that. But seeing those times and just the way we were bringing those, those world records down, um, you couldn't help think that this was special. And, and yeah, people say, God, you would have been winning the 200, 400, 800, 1500, every single meet across the line if you 
across the world um, if you didn't have Ian there? And I said, well, but maybe if I didn't have Ian there, I wouldn't be so good at those those races as mm. well. So you never know. Yeah. So I, I walked the competition and the fact I got to race an athlete of his caliber and even beat him a couple of times um, was, was a fantastic thing in my career. And, and one... Um, real highlight um, in that was 1999 when we went to World Short Course in Hong Kong and the world record was 340. Um, Ian had just broken at the trials for that meeting on 339.8 and then all of a sudden I went 335.0 and he went 335.7 in that race and we'd lowered the mark by, by another you know almost five seconds. Um, and those were things where we'd turn around and, and we were even blown away by some of the, the, the things that we were achieving. So it was just a really nice era. And I knew everything that was going on was special because you just don't get athletes of his caliber every day, if ever. Yeah, 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 no, it's, it's freaky. Man, I was on the team and I, I was thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm on a team with these superstars. And, and I knew it at the time, like how good you guys were and how dominant. I could see it in practice. And then I could see the way that you, were, you guys would perform at World Championships and Olympic Games. It was just, for me, it was phenomenal. It was incredible. But when was the first time you actually beat Kieran Perkins head to head? Funnily enough, I beat him in a surf race first when I was 15, just before the Atlanta Olympic trials. Oh, okay. um, so that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. We had this open water race, uh, which Daniel Kowalski was in as well, and I, and I won that. So that, mm. that, was, that, was, quite, that was a lot of fun. Mm. Um, the first time I really raced him properly. So I went to those Olympic trials. I, I finished fifth. Um, he went on. He won a Olympics, um, obviously, in 1996. I then raced Daniel Kowalski first in December of 1996 for the World Short Course Trials. Mm. And I remember 300 meters out, he tried to break me there and I just hung on. And then I saw that that really hurt him trying to break me and, and I won that race. Mm. Um, from there on, I won for the next 11 years. So wow. I, I raced Kieran probably, because he had a bit of time off after the Olympics, probably at the World Championships trials later on in 1997 so i first beat him there he didn't qualify for the team he finished third so it was just daniel kowalski and myself but the first real race i had against him was probably the 1998 kuala lumpur commonwealth games and he finished third i think um i think ray neithling just beat him for, for second there mm -hmm. um and then really from there every race we was kind of going head to head leading up into to the 2000 olympics where you know, he swam the best he'd ever swum in six years when he got to the 2000 Olympics since he broke the world record back in 1994. So it was good to see him get back almost to his very best. Yeah. What was that like to, to knock him off uh, in the pool for the first time? Do you remember? Uh, it was hugely satisfying on many fronts because the thing is, what people don't understand or appreciate, Kieran was my brother's main rival when they were younger. Oh. So even when I was seven years of age and they were 13, 14, they were racing at state titles and national championships and literally finished first and second in everything. Mm. And so I remember him seeing uh, him beat my brother at the state championships by a hundredth of a second in the 400 meter freestyle. So he was a fierce rival in our household from a very young age. So Watch, then watching him, and he, he turned into this household rival to this national hero and icon, and then all of a sudden he became my main rival. So it was a really interesting emotional journey in terms of my, my, my engagement and view of Kieran. Um, but he was very mentally strong. I mean, you know what he was like on the team. Like, mm. he's kind of a bit like, a, he's a bit of an ice man, you know? Like, mm. nothing seems to shake him too much. Nothing seems to get him too interested either. He kind of just focuses on himself, on his business and what he needs to do. And you don't really know if he's feeling good or if he's feeling bad. He, he's kind of just focused on whatever the objective is. He doesn't give away much. Um, so to beat him, given how dominant he was for so many years, how much he lowered that 1500 meter freestyle world record, as well as the 800 and the 400 too, um, was hugely satisfying. But beating him at the Olympics in front of my you know, home crowd and obviously his home crowd as well, that's kind of one of those moments in sport where, you know, if you've watched up, watch Wayne Gretzky in hockey, you've watched, I don't know, Sildonald Bradman in cricket, you know, Kieran Perkins was that in swimming to Australia. And so here I was as a young athlete getting an opportunity to race against this guy who was a rival, a hero, a rival again, 
um, who'd won the last two Olympics, was a world record holder in this event in front of my home crowd at Olympic Games, which you only get a once in a lifetime opportunity if you're very lucky to be born at that particular point in time. So to, to have that moment of beating your hero in front mm. of your home crowd at an Olympic Games and then hear the national anthem play, see your parents up in the crowd was, was just one of those moments that, um, yeah, you still pinch yourself the fact you got the opportunity to, to do that and then, and then to beat him. And, and what he said afterwards, he leant over the lane rope because we were lane, lanes three and four. He leant over and he, and he said to me, he said, you deserve this, oh, wow. which, was, which was really nice because we didn't exchange too much dialogue. I, I talk to Kieran a lot more these days because um, we're both in finance. So he, he lives literally across the park from me, would you believe, and works just down the road from me. So mm. um, we do see each other at events here and there and we, we always have a good chat. But um, it was really nice because I felt like our re relationship was quite frosty for him to actually say that after that, that particular event. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you talk about Kieran Perkins and who he was. Who who was Grant Hackett at that time? You know, what made what made you tick? And then, what kind of what kind of person were you? You know, honestly. Um, it's a good good question. At that particular point in time, I mean, I don't think you ever really change. I have an exceptionally strong work ethic. Yeah. So, whatever needs to be done, I will do plus some more. That yep. was, uh, and I'm, I'm very, very, I'm very tough. I mean, I know I'm a very strong person, but I know I'm very physically tough in terms of the ability to be able to push myself in training, to show up after being completely tired and fatigued. I, I have a real ability to push myself through. Um, I, I'm, I'm this sort of person, I, I love high performance, whether it's sport or business, but I like to have fun doing it. Mm. I like to enjoy my peers. I like to enjoy the environments I'm in. I like to have a laugh because I figure if you're able to, you can take on a more intense workload and you can have more intensity if there are light, light moments in what you're doing. Um, so you need to have a laugh with your teammates, but at the same time, you know, you need to know when to be serious and when to focus. Mm -hmm. But if it's all serious and it's all focus, it's all execution base and it's all discipline, then at the end of the day, you kind of, you, you lose sight of what you're doing and you burn out. And it makes it difficult where I felt like what I was really good at was intensifying my focus and my work ethic was really strong, but I was a lighthearted sort of character around that. And I used to enjoy um, the, the social side of the sport, my, my teammates, my training partners. Um, I always uh, enjoyed promoting the sport too. Um, I, my values are very strong around loyalty and and I was very loyal to the sport. I wanted to see the sport improve. I wanted to see it grow. I wanted to see it evolve. And what I loved about having Thorpey there or Michael Phelps come along is you could see the profile of the sport growing. Um, so that also meant a, a lot to me as well. Um, and I was also very loyal with the, the relationship I had with my coach. I mean, I've been coached for Dennis for a total of 22 years um, mm, overall. Yeah. Career, which not too many athletes have, have a coach for, for that sort of period. So... Yeah, but for me back then too, I, I was also a little bit scared. Um, my first Olympic Games, being a young kid, I was almost scared of my own home country too because um, everyone loved Kieran so much and wanted to see him win three in a row, which no one had ever done before, mm. um, that I was worried that people might hate me too if I actually beat the guy. So there was always a little bit of fear and trepidation going into to those big moments, particularly... Um, you know, I was only 19 um, at the Olympic trials. I was 20 by the time the Olympics came around. But there was a lot of stuff to confront, um, I think, for me, both mentally and emotionally, as well as the physical output of the training. Yeah, it's interesting you, you talk about that, you know. Um, and, and I'm glad you brought up Dennis because you did have a long-term relationship with him in, in terms of him being your coach. Um, what was Dennis like? Dennis is um, an icon in swimming. Obviously, he's gone on to, um, you know, coach some, some incredible athletes. And, and I even want to ask your, maybe your opinion on, on him coaching Sun Yang, because I think that's, that's an important, you know, part of the conversation. But, you know, in terms of just coaching you, what, what was that like to be coached by Dennis Cottrell? Um, Dennis will either break you or make you Olympic champion. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what it's like being coached by <laughs> Dennis Cottrell. Yeah. His programs would always be probably the – top three in terms of you know how, how difficult and challenging they were in the world at any point in time so 
Um, he had a pretty set methodology um, that, that he knew worked. He was so passionate and driven um, in the sport too. And there was no fuss about Dennis. He called a spade a spade. If you weren't doing the work, if something was going wrong, um, if, if you weren't focused on, on the, object, of the objectives that needed to be achieved throughout the, the course of the training cycle leading into a meet, you knew about it straight away. So, um, and he was, he was, again, very, very loyal. I mean, Dennis took really no international athletes when I was training with him because he didn't want to give up my training programs. He didn't want to give away, you know, I, I guess my attributes or characteristics that you would see from a day-to-day -day point of view that gave me that ability to be, to be so dominant in the races that I chose. So I think um, for, for Dennis, the, the number one thing that I love about him is his passion for the sport and the way he wants to see performances improve. He doesn't care which athlete it is from which country. He just wants to see great performances mm. and he loves to, to be involved with them in any way he can. He always wants to help. He always wants to see people do well. Um, he's not a political person um, at all. He doesn't like to play those games. He likes to focus on the job and that is it. Um, and he's unapologetic about that. And what I always had with Dennis, um, I'm probably better friends with him now than what I was when I was swimming, but we always had a very um, professional relationship. I wouldn't go around and hang out with Dennis at his house. Mm. You know, I'd go there once or twice when the squad would, would go there because he lived on the beach and we'd sort of do a surf session for a little bit of fun just to break up the monotony of all the pool work. But um, we were very much um, athlete, what the, the, the training plan was, the training cycles were, what needed to be done and achieved in training for me to get the performance or the goal that we were looking for at the next major meet or, or coming into a, a selection trial. So, and that was it. Um, and, and I think that professional dynamic gave us longevity as well because it wasn't as emotional as perhaps some other sort of coach athlete relationships could be. Cause I think when a lot of emotion can come into it, you lose sight of the logical or rational objectives um, because it is such a challenging environment and high pressured environment to, to be in. But um, I probably, um, I, I enjoyed being coached by Ian Pope and this is not applied on him, but I probably regret somewhat not going into to Beijing with him just because of all the history um, that we'd had together. Um, I probably made a mistake there, but at the same time, I, I needed to change up, not so much my coach, but I needed to change up my training environment because I'd spent literally at that particular point in time, 22 years going up and down the same black yeah. line. And, and that was becoming um, tiring for me, particularly as a distance athlete when you're doing the extra kilometers. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. I understand that for sure. You know, you know, change is always good, but you know, when you're under something good, you, you should always stick to it. But 22 years is a long time, but uh, that's a, that's a lot of time to be doing Dennis Cottrell's work, man. I I, I couldn't last 22 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> but but I've in seen you do a at IM before Hawkey, and it's not uh, pretty. Oh, mate, it's not pretty at all. But then that's the thing: is your your capacity for work was unlike anybody else. Did you take pleasure in crushing people? in practice oh, i love it i love it i still <laughs> love it if i can do it somehow i um you know I, I used to just love being able to see how much more i could do i mean I, I remember dennis being able to to set super you know hard training sessions with really difficult short rest cycles you know doing 400s down to 410 cycle um you know long long course meters and and, you know, when, when you, the set would be done and I felt like I could give more, I'd do one or two more wow. um, to prove to myself that I could do more, even if it was a, a hugely challenging set that probably no one had ever done before. So I loved that. And I, and I there's always a certain satisfaction. I used to um, use some rabbits sometimes. Like I'd, I'd put someone mm. out like 20 meters in front of me or 20 seconds in front of me in certain sets. And I used mm. to just hunt them down. And, then, yeah. and when you're coming for every single lap and you, you see that gap closing shorter and shorter and shorter, it's, it's really satisfying. And, and look, it's good. I used to train with a, a lot of different athletes, a lot of different training partners over time. And it was good for them because it always improved their performance because mm -hmm. I would push them, to make them better athletes. And, and we had to find different ways of doing it for me because you didn't want to be stuck out in a lane all, all on your own, doing your own sets the whole time because that gets a little bit boring too. You've got to find little tricks i guess you could say in terms of being able to improve yourself push yourself and and step it up a little bit more and also mentally um to be able to absorb all that work was really really challenging but at the same time i, I took a lot of pride in it i loved pushing myself i loved seeing the outcome of it and i just knew 
that it was sharpening me up for a great performance. And, and that I just got a lot of satisfaction out of that. Not everybody does like that degree of challenge um, in whatever they're trying to achieve. But for me, I gravitate naturally towards it. And, uh, and I know hard work and effort and consistency always pays off and, and it proves, it's proven it to me, not just in sport, but in business as well, those behaviors and that, that degree of focus is always the same. And, um, yeah. and I just took pride in it too. Yeah, man, I'm watching uh, this series called The Last Dance right now about Michael Jordan and, and, his, um, and his run with the Bulls. Are, are you watching any of that at all? I, I'm going to, to watch okay. it, but yeah, well, no, we're yeah. going to talk about it, man, but I'd yeah. love to see that. Man, it's pretty in, in, intense, and, and, and you, get a, you get a glimpse into who he was behind the scenes and obviously the way he practiced. Um, and, and I'm sure you know the stories of, you know, Kobe Bryant as well. And Kobe was an inspiration for this podcast, um, just, just in his death. And, and, um, you know, I really wanted to get something done, but do you see similarities in yourself with people like that, with, with Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, people that hold other people to a standard as well, not just themselves, like, you know, when they're out practicing, did you feel like, were you, were you a tough person to, to practice with? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would call anybody out who wasn't doing the sets, wasn't doing the training. Um, and I was very, very direct and probably sometimes super harsh as well. So yeah. um, not that I compare myself to, to those types of, you know, they're, they're global sporting heroes. There's got to be statues around the world of those guys forever. But in, in terms of my level of dedication to, to my craft and um, being able to, to make the people around me accountable, absolutely. I'd even make Dennis accountable, I think. I, I, I used to finish a meet where, say, Thorpey would beat me, and I used to get so frustrated um, because I thought I'd done enough to be able to maybe capture that moment in the 400-meter freestyle. And I used to write down sets and thinking, okay, I can improve, I can do this, I can do this. And I used to give them to Dennis, and they were super hard sets that probably no one's ever done before. And I used to put the times that I wanted to achieve next to them. And I'll give them to him and I said, we've got to try some of these because I, I feel like my back end's not strong enough and, and maybe this will help. So for me, I, I think um, I didn't really think about goal setting or accountability or ownership or discipline or commitment or teamwork. I think I just gravitated naturally towards those things because the objective and the outcome and the goal meant so much to me that I knew I had to do those things automatically if I wanted to see that moment. I, I wasn't blind in any sort of way. I, I knew the dedication and focus and I knew what I needed from the people around me too, in terms of their contribution. Even the physiotherapist, I would challenge them on certain aspects of, of what they were doing. And I think if you want to be the best, but if you become the best and you want to stay the best, you have to make sure that every single person around you has the same degree of focus towards their craft and what they're doing to get the best out of themselves if they're going to work with you because there's no good if you're going to have people who want to be there and want to be second or who want to kid themselves and not do the work but want the outcome it just doesn't work like that in life so um for me i was i was very performance focused a, a, across the board and look you know i think a lot of my my training partners were, were thankful for that because they got a lot more out of themselves in terms of their performance and focus and i think what you let slide in yourself you let slide in others so i was always very very conscious of knowing what I did in a good preparation and the discipline I had and then reflecting on probably what was a poor preparation and poor execution at race time, according to the standard that I wanted. I, I even think back now to different parts of my career or um, in terms of my sporting career and what I did then well, and when I got a great outcome versus when I had a preparation that I knew was slightly off and, and I didn't quite get my outcome. And it's always a behavioral thing. Um, I even think back to moments as young as 11, I remember I was heavily involved in surf lifesaving um, here in Australia and I, and I lost a national surf lifesaving race when I was 11. And I knew I was going to lose that race because I knew I didn't do the preparation. And I knew I didn't have the intense focus. I won it when I was 10. And I, learned, and I still think back to that preparation now when I do things. Like those, those lessons you learn in time um, put you in such good stead now. And I remember what I did as a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, as a nipper, where I won those races again and became dominant again. And I knew it was all around the preparation and the discipline around the preparation that got me those outcomes. Not, not, not right day. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Man. I love that sound, but some, some information in there is so critical for young swimmers and, and even coaches to hear. It's really incredible stuff that you're talking right now. Now, how many years was it? Did you say you didn't lose a 1500 for? 
It was a uh, it was eleven years. So I eleven lost, years. Yeah, ninety six Olympic trials, and then until the two thousand and seven World Championships. Oh my so, god, mate, yeah. that is ridiculous. <laughs> So, you know, when, when, when you line up behind the blocks, you know, you want everything to be perfect. Not everything's going to be perfect for 11 years. How do you line up against the best athletes in the world? Everybody's gunning for you and not everything's perfect and still win. Like, were there moments where you know, no, I wasn't at my best then, but I still won? Oh, I think 2004 was, was one of those moments. I mean, I, I remember high-fiving, high-fiving you after the 1500 in mm. um in athens and i just won that race over larson jensen who was a phenomenal competitor um i i wasn't you know i had a um partially collapsed lung in that race because i mm. had a chronic chest infection for nine months because i got pneumonia at the start of the year from overtraining so mm. i trained always hard but not always smart so <laughs> there's a few lessons in that as well and and so that race i knew i wasn't at my best but i still wanted that outcome so badly um, and to give you a bit of a sense of how badly I wanted, I remember turning on the last wall, uh, second last wall, the 1400 metre mark. And I'd never ever, for eight years at that particular point, ever turned with someone I had competition near me or ahead of me. The closest margin I had, I think, was about five seconds between myself and the next person, which was Kieran Perkins back in 2000. So I'd always been so far ahead going to that last 100 metres. It wasn't a matter of, you know, winning. It was a matter of breaking a world record or how far I could win by. And in 2001, when I broke the world record by seven seconds, the last 100 metres, I did 56.6. And oh, everything was perfect that day. Everything went well. I felt great. Now that last 100 metres. Now, when I turned and I saw Larson there, I just had this mindset, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, which really I spent two days, um, particularly after the heat swim, telling myself that was my degree of commitment towards executing that race as best I could, given I wasn't in an ideal situation, far from it. And I turned and I saw Larson right there. I was in lane three, he was in lane six. And I just, I, I actually crapped myself for a second. I thought, oh my God, he's right there. He's caught right up to me. I think it was 0.1 of a second between us. Mm. And I just went, whatever it takes. And I put my head down, focused on my stroke, brought my legs in. And I ended up going 56.0. Mm. So wow. it's the fastest nearly I've ever come back in a 1500 in my worst situation. So definitely there are points in time and performances where desire of the outcome and the willingness to commit and see that you can actually pull more out of yourself at your worst, sometimes at your best, just proves a, a really, um, you know, sort of interesting point to, you know, your ability to see competitors there and how much they actually improve your performance. And that's what lasts in that particular day. So there was plenty of moments throughout that journey where things went perfect but I think I was so consistent on preparation and wanting to improve all the time and wanting to set the the bar higher that overall even on my bad days I was so well prepared over such a long period that I could still get away with it and I still should have uh, in, in my view if I raced better in Beijing I still should have been able to, to win that race but uh, it wasn't the fact that I wasn't good enough it was my race strategy just wasn't good enough and, and that's what cost me um, that outcome to, to, to Maluli on that particular day. Yeah. But I mean, going, uh, you know, even with that, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, standing behind the blocks and understanding the pressure that you're under, were you always good at compartmentalizing things? Because the whole world's watching you, the, everybody's expecting this gold medal from Grant Hackett and, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you. Believe me, I know it. I was your teammate. So I could, I, I read the papers and, and, and things that were going on at the time. We didn't have the social media that they have these days, thank God. But um, there was always a mob of people following you. So in terms of the pressure to win, were you good at just compartmentalizing that and then just and focusing just on the performance itself? Yeah, it was, it was quite funny the way mentally I worked. I um, I would get more nervous a few days out from a major race than what I would a few minutes out or an hour out. I mm. actually, I always loved the, the point of execution. So I don't really like marshalling areas. I never really enjoyed it in there, but I loved walking out and I loved standing behind the blocks. I mm. actually felt when I would walk out, I'd, I'd feel relaxed. Like all that pressure, everything would just drop away. Mm. And I was just so focused on the race strategy and what I needed to do. And I just felt good. So for, for me, that moment, I was always very good. In terms of 
I guess all that external pressure that's put on you over time, you don't realize how much that builds up. And I have to say, I, I did feel that quite a bit in 2004 because I was ill and I was starting to, you know, people were starting to talk about, oh, no one's ever won for, for 10 years straight. You're at eight years now. Mm-hmm. And people started talking around, um, you know, setting these records and, and all these various things that I didn't really think about or didn't really put too much importance on. I put importance always on the next race. That was always my focus. And then all of a sudden when I, I got to this point where, <clears throat> pardon me, I felt like I was actually defending my record. And so instead of playing offense, I was playing defense. Mm. And you know what happened when I started doing that? The gap started closing. My dominance started to, to, to shrink and, and reduce. And then all of a sudden, once I got through 2004 and you know, got better, in 2005, I was like, I'm over that. I don't care if I get beaten, but I know I'm going to put everything on my performance and I'm going to execute races the way I want to execute them and challenge myself and take it out hard and see if I die. And if I do, I do. And all of a sudden, my dominance came back and it came back much, much better because I was a better athlete. I was a more mature athlete. I won World Swimmer of the Year, I think, there in 2005. Broke Ian Thorpe's 800 meter world record. Things went so much better just because of that simple mind shift of going, instead of worrying about them catching up to you, why don't you worry about how far ahead you can get? And so for me, if I had that mindset, um, it always put me in, in much better stead rather than sort of worrying about what the competition did. I think the big advantage I had that gave me longevity and dominance was the fact everyone goes, oh, you're only as good as your last race. My attitude is, no, you're only as good as your next one. So I was always very forward thinking. And um, as soon as I finished a race, even if I'd won, I would still have the same level of criticism as if I'd lost. And I think that gave me a big competitive advantage because I didn't get carried away with winning. I was more focused on how can I improve and set the bar higher again. And almost that little bit of paranoia of like, yeah, everyone's coming after me all the time. So I have to think like that. I don't have a choice but to think like that if I want to continue to, to win. But in terms of that pressure, yeah, I was good at probably um, shifting it and comp- compartmentalizing it. But mm-hmm. I always had to address it. And I always had to think about it and I always had to shift it because if you sit there and you ignore pressure and you become ignorant towards things, they become more challenging. And I think I realized that pressure was making me more more of a defensive athlete than an ambitious athlete. So you had to be conscious of how it was impacting your behaviors or your thoughts and then address it and then you could shift forward. So I think for me, I never played the game of ignorance of that sort of pressure. I always addressed it. And I always used it when I could. I always thought, well, well, if people think I can win, it must mean I'm pretty good too. So I would try and, you know, sort of turbocharge my confidence around that sort of pressure as well. Yeah. Mate, you always uh, gave me so much confidence. I loved being your friend and I loved the support that you gave me. I remember you standing there with your shirt off at the, at, at the Athens Olympics cheering, cheering for me in the Olympic final. And I, I so wanted to be as good as you. <laughs> I so wanted to win because I had, I had the support of my teammates, you know, and the belief of my teammates. Um, you, always gave your, you always gave your teammates a lot of belief too and, and you're always there for us and I always appreciate that you were never a selfish athlete. You're always, um, you're always one of the best athletes in, in history and yet you're always there for us and I want you to know that I appreciate that and I felt that and it meant a lot to me and it meant a lot to you know, your teammates that you were just human and you believed in us and, and you were so into Australian swimming you know you you were so proud to be Australian and, and I mate, I always love that so much oh thanks Hawkey it's 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 actually very important to me as much as I talk about you know my I guess application towards what I do in my discipline I really get a lot of pleasure out of seeing others improve and mm. step up and, mm. and I think for me that's my lighter side as well like I enjoy the camaraderie and the loyalty as teammates. I enjoy mm. seeing people improve. I, I want to support them in any way I can. And I want to give them advice if, if that they ask it. I'm not a sort of person who wants to preach by any means, but mm. I always love to, to help athletes out who, who need a little bit of guidance or, or who just ask the question, how did you get there? What did you do? You know, I feel like this. Did you ever feel like that in your career? And, and I think um, for us, we had a very strong dynamic in terms of, I mean, you would even keep a check and balance on me. If I did something wrong, you would call it out hockey and I would do the same thing. So Mm -hmm. I think we've a very honest and open dynamic and a very um, healthy relationship amongst our teammates. And I think that's why that sort of 
circle that you spoke about, whether it was Clemmy, whether it was Thorpey, whether it was yourself, whether it was Matt Welsh, whoever it was on our team, it didn't mm. matter. There was no double standards. We all played by the same rules. And I always use the analogy, um, if Kobe Bryant, you know, rocked up late to training and the coach didn't let him play on the weekend, do you think anybody else would rock up late? Mm -hmm. And that's what we had. If the team bus was leaving at 4 p.m., it left at 4 p.m. And if you were, you were going to pay the consequences of either having to, to walk to the pool or, or something else, you know, train harder or do a harder set or do an extra few K. So there was no double standards within our team. And, um, and I think the thing that you and I did really well is that we did put that initial leadership to team together to make sure that the athletes felt like they had support from within because not everything you want to go to your coach or you want to go to a parent about. Sometimes you want to feel like there's peer support in there. And I think we were naturally conscious of these things. So I think, um, and, and we also were genuine. I think a big part of any sort of leadership is, is being genuine and giving a bit of yourself away. And I think um, our team did that really really well and we did it for the right reasons not because we wanted to be leaders but because we just thought it was the right thing to do yeah no absolutely well said mate mate a couple of funny stories you know we'll throw a couple in there um <laughs> uh, you know I, I remember um you know i tell this story all the time i guess there's a couple but i tell this story all the time where we're in fukuoka and you're laying on the massage table right and you remember this where where you're just exhausted you've been through You've been no, through Yokohama. Yokohama. I was in Yokohama. Right? Okay, it was near yeah, somewhere yeah, in Japan. <laughs> I had my head on too, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, <Michua>, so. <laughs> <laughs> Tokyo. Now, somewhere in Japan, we're there, but we'd just been to Commonwealth Games. I think it was 2002, right? Yeah, it was 2002. It was Pan yeah. Panpax 2002. Yeah, we'd just been to a brutal Commonwealth Games and traveling yeah. all over. The traveling. Place, yeah. We went back to Australia, and then we flew up to Japan. Then we you had did a World whole... Chalk Wars in Moscow that year. Where we all got sick. Oh, and, oh yeah, that know, was awful. It was God. a big year. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big year. We are doing a lot. But, like, you're, <laughs> you're laying on the massage table, and I remember coming in, and I uh, just got off the bus, but you were preparing for the 1500, which was on the last day, and and you were just exhausted. And then... You know, I, I played a little game with you that I've, I've spoken about a couple of times, but just uh, it was very unusual for you to be negative about anything. And it was very unusual for you to show that level of fatigue. But you, I mean, you were exhausted. You'd done a whole program at Commonwealth Games. You traveled back to Australia. You've done a whole program for the Pam Packs, and you are sitting there and you hadn't been beaten in a number of years. And I know that meant a lot to you. So when you are sitting there, and, and again, it wasn't hard to get under your skin. So I wasn't some sort of genius that, that you know, but, but basically I told you that. You, you, knew, know, you knew you well. You knew I knew you well brother. enough. Yeah. So I knew you well enough to say that the Americans were talking some smack on the bus on the way over because, you know, I could tell that you were fatigued and, and there was something missing from you that I knew that, hang on, if, if Grant's not at his best here, he is, he is going to be challenged. I don't know if you'd ever get beaten, but you were going to be challenged. Well, I said to you, um, you said, oh, what are you going to do in the 15 tonight? And I said, look, mate, I think I'm just going to race to, to win. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I had like literally the 200, the 400, the 800, the 1500, the mm -hmm. 4x1, the 4x2 mm -hmm. in two meets, international meets, in six-day meets too. They weren't even eight-day meets. So yeah. back to back. that was the very last day. Yeah, so, so I was feeling tired. And I knew I had such a level of dominance at that stage that I could probably go, you know, not quite flat out and still be able to get the result that I wanted. So, yeah, so I and I knew that, that just wasn't you. Like, like winning yeah. for you wasn't enough. Like no. Yeah, yeah. You wanted to dominate. You're always a dominating character, and, and and that was the difference between you and and anyone else that I really knew. Like, you wanted to dominate people. It wasn't enough to beat people, and so I knew that just that just didn't fit your character to say I'm just going to swim to win. And so, you know, I made up this story that the Americans were talking about you on the bus, and that just got under yeah. your skin like I hadn't seen before. You even said one thing. You said Eric Vent's been, you know, talking this and that and saying you're looking tired. And I was like, Eric's a good friend of mine. I was like, Yeah, yeah. Said, really? <laughs> I was, and then you, then you came back around. You circled back around. You go, I heard Larson Jensen in a press conference yesterday. I just got word that he's been saying this is the time to beat you. And I was like, What's going on with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to get under your skin. It wasn't working because you're like, No, no, I'm friends with these guys. And I'm like, No, you know, they might be friends, you know, on the surface, but away from you, they're saying something completely different. And you, you were just perplexed. You were like, I can't believe this. Like, and it's really so started, it, yeah, it really started got, to irritate you. I was so frustrated because he kept coming around and telling me about it. And I was like, I was done. I was like, That's it. 
I'm going to smash these guys tonight. <laughs> like, I, got so, I always got so edgy. Yeah, but I remember. I put my headphones on, which I rarely do. I'm not the sort of person that chucks the headphones on to, to psych myself up. But then I was like, no one's talking to me. I'm focused. Like, yeah. this is it. Yeah, I remember Dennis Cottrell coming up to me before the race. He's like, mate, what did you say to him? He's so pissed off right now. I've never seen him so pissed off. I was like, <laughs> you know, I was laughing. But, uh, but and, then you, and then you just dominate this race. I think it was at that time, I think it was the second fastest swim you'd done in history, you know, to, to, keep, to get that level fastest. of performance. Yeah, it was the second fastest swim in history, full stop, outside yeah. of the world record the, the year before. Yeah. So... Yeah, and I had no plans of doing anything like that that night. <laughs> it was really funny. It actually felt really good, that race. Like, it wasn't <laughs> hard. And I remember, because I had, you know, Eric Vent on one side, I had Larson Jensen on the other. I was in lane four. And um, every time I turned, I was just dominating these guys because I always used to try and push them back on the bottom, you know, the tiles on the bottom of the pool. Mm. And I was like, I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> And, and I ended up winning that race. I think I beat one of them by 45 meters and the other one by a lap. It was, yeah. it was a huge margin. I don't think they broke 15 minutes. Yeah, it was massive. And, so we, and I actually turned around mm. and I've never done something this arrogant in my life. And I still cringe when I think about it. I turned around and I went like this. I just put both my arms up to both of them. And mm. I was like, come on. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. You guys kind of talk crap about me and... Mm. and Expect me not to do this now. Yeah. So yeah, I think you mouthed it on television. There was a few words in there that that we can't yeah. repeat right now. But it was it was so funny. And then I remember and you then, coming out of, of of the water. You were so heated still. You were so fired yeah. up. I've, it was like a prize fighter. Like someone just got out of a heavyweight bout, and you were so jacked up. You know, I remember putting the towel around you. And, and I just felt at that time, like, I better say something to him now before he punches one of these guys in the face. So, so I remember telling you, I was like, mate, I just made that up. And you were, you were so pissed off. Oh. No, I was, I wasn't pissed off. I was like shocked. I was shocked. It was on TV back, back here in Australia. And you see my face because you're literally like the first or second person that saw me as I got out of the pool, like literally out of the pool. You're sitting right there and you've come up to me and given me the towel. And then you've said this to me and I was like, what? I was, and I, thought, I just did that back there. I was like so, in such shock. But I was so thankful to you afterwards because at that point in time, it was the second best 1500 that I'd ever done. And I, I never would have got that performance unless you, you did that to me, you know, yeah. got, got up in the right way. Well, I learned so much about coaching and that helped me go into coaching that psychology was such a huge part of performance and that we could, we've got so much more in us than we think we had. And I learned that from you uh, wholeheartedly. Like I became uh, a great coach because of the, the things that I learned from you. And, and, uh, and, and I'm so thankful for that. It, it, it wasn't something that you can learn in a textbook. You know, it's, mm. it's something that I just had to learn practically. And it was, and it helped me, you know, with a guy like Cesar Cielo, who was, very mental and, and, and thought exactly the same way you, he wanted to dominate people. And there were times where I really had to figure out how to get the best out of him. And, and the things that I learned from you and the way that I watched you and just the way that you performed were, was so incredible. Um, you know, I have this, I have this situation with Caesar. I'm sure you can relate to this. Um, he, he didn't want to swim the hundred freestyle in Beijing because he didn't think he could win. And um, yeah. so he didn't want to go to the final. He actually made the final. He qualified in lane eight. And I remember yeah. going, the, the finals were in the morning. I remember going to his room in the morning and it was pitch black. He was still asleep. We had to get on the bus to go to the finals. And I remember opening the door, turning the light on and, and just kind of scratching his foot and saying, you know, wake up, Caesar. It's time, time for the final. Yeah, it's the Olympics. Get up. And, and he just flat out told me, I'm, I'm not going. I, I don't want to swim. You know, I, I can't win, so I don't want to go. And I couldn't understand that mentality. The only way that I could relate it was if I thought of a guy like Grant Hackett who had a very similar mentality, like uh, it's, it's winning or nothing for me. And, and I never thought like that, honestly. So it was hard to comprehend that mentality. But, but I said to it's him. Really, it's really hard. Mm. Sorry. Just to no, inject, but it's really hard when people don't understand that your range of failure is so fine. And by mm. fine, my range of failure was winning. And mm. if it was second or worse, it was complete and utter failure. Yeah. Yeah. So same I same thing. The medal for people at Olympics or world champs, that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like chuck those on the TV, tell the kids about those and the grandkids. And that's an awesome, awesome. And I, and I, 
don't get me wrong, when, when you see other people who've achieved those things, you know they're awesome feats and they're amazing things just to get to Olympics rather than actually get a medal. Mm-hmm. But for me, I, I, it was complete failure. And it still mm-hmm. is when I think about my silvers. Yeah. Uh, and that was his mentality. You know, he was in lane eight. He's like, I'm, I can't win this thing. I don't want to, I don't want to perform. I don't want to compete. And I was like, so the only way that I could convince him, he, he started to put on a uniform that was the regular, um, you know, uniform that you'd wear to the prelims and, and they had a podium uh, uniform and, and he, and um, he started to put on the regular uniform. And I said, this is the, the uniform that you meant to wear on the podium. And he's like, well, I'm not getting on the podium, so I, I'm not wearing that uniform. And I said to him, I'm going to get on a plane back to Australia or back to the U.S. Um, if you don't put this podium uniform on because you're getting on the podium this morning. That's the only decision we're making. You're, you're going to get on the bus. You're going to be wearing the podium uniform, and you're going to swim, and you're going to get on the podium. And you're going to agree to me. Otherwise, I'm leaving right now. I'm going back to the U.S. And, uh, and, and he made that decision. He said, okay, I'm... I'll put it on and I'm going to get on the podium. And, and he ended up winning the bronze medal in the 50, in the hundred free. And then that catapulted his belief system into saying, I can win the 50 freestyle now uh, I'm going to win, you know, and, and it just changed his persona. So the psychology of swimming is so huge. I think it's so undervalued. And I, and like I said, I learned so much from watching you. So that, that was an incredible. Yeah. Story. I think, um, he- yeah, people don't understand um, that aspect of it to, to the extent they probably should. For, for me, a lot of the, the mental preparation was done through the physical. So I knew if I did the hard work and mm-hmm. um, you know, regardless of how I was feeling on the day, I, I could still get the result. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember the only time where I felt like I was going to lose, and I did, was in 2007 at the World Championships. Um, and everyone was telling me not to compete because they knew I wasn't having a good meet. My, my ex-wife actually got quite ill before that meet. And so I didn't really train much in the, the last five weeks because I was trying to spend the time with, with her. And nobody really knows that story. And I certainly didn't divulge that at, at the time. Um, and everyone was saying, oh, look, you, you know, why don't you just pull out um, and then just wait for, for Beijing and all the meets afterwards. And, uh, and I knew it was a wrong thing to pull out. I was like, no, nah, you know what? My country's backed me to be here if I can get on the blocks and compete and I made the final, um, I think I finished sixth or seventh. Um, but I, I wasn't going to win that day, but I always felt like if I was going to compete for my country and I felt like it was important for my teammates to see, even if I knew when I was extremely vulnerable and it was almost impossible to, to not win, you would still go out there and still try and win. Mm. And, um, and I think that's, that's an important part of being a competitor too. You've got to make sure that even on your bad days, there's got to be a greater reason than just winning to show up and your teammates, your country, your family, your coach, your teammates, like all that stuff forms a big part of that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good message for young people too, mate. Um, I remember another funny story, you know, I don't know what your memory of this is like, but my memory is pretty clear that, you know, you just won the 1500 in Athens and it was, it was the last day, you know, we're, we're done and, you know, within a couple of hours, we decided to go out to a, to a club and have some fun. But the club was about an hour drive um, out of out of the village, and so we decided to get a taxi. And it was it was myself um, in the front seat, and in the back seat it was it was you, um, you know, Ian Thorpe and yeah. and Michael Clem. So I'm sitting in the front seat, and we're driving. And and as we take off, we're going. But this 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 taxi driver i don't know if it's normal but he's driving like a hundred miles an hour down these thin little roads and he's weaving in and out of traffic and i'm i'm holding on like for dear life and i'm just thinking to myself you know i've got three olympic gold medalists in the back if we die right now no one's going to give a shit that brett hawk just died you know it's going to be all grant hackett ian thorpe and michael Klim just died in a car crash uh, do you remember that taxi ride oh I, I do. I do. I remember having pancakes with you the next morning too. <laughs> oh, I actually, there was one step before that you forgot. I, um, and I, I get a memory all the time on this was when I was coming back into the, the village and you know, it's like, cause you've done your press conferences and drug tests and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And then you were standing there in the middle with a big bottle of champagne and you just, 
it poured it all over me as I came in. You know, the ribbon of that medal, out of all my Olympic medals, it's the only one that's crumbled. It's just, it's just crumbled. It's got champagne all over it. I always think of you with the champagne over my head when I, when I, when I look at that gold medal for Athens. <laughs> Mate, I was always so proud of you. I don't know why. I just uh, I took so much pride in your performances and, and the way that you performed. I was just in awe of you, the way that you were able to uh, train, handle the media, handle the pressure, and then go out there and perform. Uh, I just felt like a little brother to you. Uh, I'm older than you, so maybe I felt like a big brother. But um, but I always just felt a part of your performances and because you let me in. You know, It wasn't like you shut me out. You weren't this superstar who just kept to yourself. Like, you let people in, and I always felt so proud. So like I wanted to make sure that you knew that I was so proud of you. So I'm, I remember just like, you know, looking for some champagne and wanting to be there when you got back and wanting to pour it all over you. Cause it was, cause I knew, I knew how much that meant to you as well and how much you'd worked for those performances. And mate, you put, you put in more effort than I had seen anybody put in. And, and I think, um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's really, really funny because you, the more you actually put into other people, the more they give you back for your own mm. performance too. If you're mm. selfish and narrow-minded and you don't really care about anyone else and you're willing to stomp on people's heads just to get your outcome, mm. it never ends well. Um, but if, if, if you actually do bring people in and, and you are you know, open, honest, transparent um, in your approach and you're genuine towards your teammates, instead of stomping on your, their heads, they actually put their hands under your feet and push you up. And I think for me, um, my, my teammates and the, and the people that I had behind me and supporting was a massive part of my performance. And, you know, you and I was, was super close through those years because I think we thought very similar. We wanted to see the whole team do very well. I, mm. I, remember, I remember we got the T-shirts printed with everyone's numbers on the back. You know, we even started up the Swimmers Association as well because we wanted to see everyone fairly treated. So there was so many things that we did. And I, and I think... You know, you don't think of it at the time because I wasn't doing those things to see it come back to me in tenfold from support from my teammates, but it just naturally does. And I remember when I got made captain of the team in 2005, they, they brought that role back in. For the next three years, the last three years of my career, I got Swimmer's Swimmer of the Year. And I was like, no, no, I shouldn't. I actually always said I shouldn't be receiving this because I'm captain. I'm just doing my job mm. by supporting you. But um, you know, I really got a lot of satisfaction out of seeing people people do well and other people being invested in what you're doing and your performance. And I think that's a really important part of the journey that can't be undervalued because otherwise your performances and sharing those moments just on your own or people just wanting to be hanger honors or whatever, I don't know, that, that sits really uncomfortable with me. You want to have people in there and family in there because they genuinely saw you do well and you, you brought them along the journey with you and you, you let them in. So, and I think that's a really, really important part of the dynamic and the aspect of, of being an athlete. Everyone talks about how selfish you have to be. Yeah, you have to be selfish in terms of you have to sacrifice social time and other things, but you don't have to be selfish as an individual in terms of emotionally what you give to other people. You can still do that. I think that's, yeah. a, that's a bunch of rubbish. Yeah, mate. Yeah, no, I agree. You you actually gave me your goggles from the uh, the fifteen hundred that you won in Athens. You gave me your goggles because I asked for them, but you you just gave them to me. But, uh, but I was uh, I've still got them too. So if anybody wants Grant Hackett's goggles, they go up on eBay after this. But no, I'm kidding. You did Swedish, wouldn't they? Would have been yeah, 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 yeah. Swedes, yeah. mate. Just just the the white Swedes. So. No, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's cool. But listen, um, so what was it, how was it like having a relationship with Ian Thorpe? I mean, obviously he's a superstar and he's, um, he's one of your competitors and you guys kind of met in the middle in the 400. How did yeah. you, cause I never felt tension between you two. How did you manage to be such great competitors, but also, um, be, be good friends? It's probably the weirdest rivalry of all time in terms of that because we just didn't care about it once we got outside of the pool. And I don't know how we both felt like that. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think it's because we started on this journey really from the start to, together, um, you know, from all the major meets and we were young. We were just a couple of teenagers and we were kind of thrown in together. We'd meet in the 400. The first couple of years, I kind of dominated him. Then all of a sudden, he just shot through the stratosphere. Um, and, I, and I just think... We, could, we just really knew how to leave it in the water. And then we'd compete in the relays together. So how good is it when you're kind of rocking up for a relay and you look beside you, you've got Michael Clem on one side and you've got Ian Thorpe on the other. You're like, 
good luck to everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So it was, um, it was really nice to have um, his ability and talent and level of performance and consistency of performance on our team. And I, and I appreciated that for what it was. And I appreciated the fact that he was actually making me better um, at the time. And, and I think, you know, we, we could just get along as teammates and we actually supported each other on many fronts, not just in swimming, but some of the commercial aspects of things that we were doing outside of the pool. And, um, and I just think that made for a healthy relationship. And, and we knew that there was nothing to gain if we brought that rivalry outside of the water because we mm. were teammates and foremost yeah. and rivals. Um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, I didn't have that with every competitor along the way, but I, I certainly had that with Ian. It was quite funny. I remember even going to the Athens Olympics. We were just out in the balcony and we were talking. He said, I so badly want to win the 200, you know, particularly after what happened with Peter Van Hoogen Van mm. um, Sydney. And obviously he had Peter again, he had Michael Phelps who wanted to, to win that race and he was really coming into his own. And, um, and I said, yeah, I so badly want to win the 1500, blah, 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 you know. And then we looked at each other and I was like, I want to win the 400 too. And he's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 and we kind of just laughed about it. And that was it. We just didn't care. And, you know, he yeah. beat me by 0.1 of a second. So I was stoked about that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> a silver medal to be behind Ian is not the worst thing in the world. But we, we had a healthy competitive tension in the water and, and that was it. You know? yeah. And we supported each other the rest of the time. Yeah, mate. Um... Look, I know you've had your own challenges in life. I've had challenges too, but mine aren't on the front page of the newspaper, you know? And, and so in terms of that, you know, what did you, what did you learn from that? I, I don't care about the challenges you've had because I've had my own, you know, so we've all had some, so I'm not going to be judgmental on, on things that have been hard for you, but you know, in terms of what, like, what can you learn from it? Looking back, like what are the things that you really learned from some of the challenges you've had? I think the biggest thing that I've actually learned, I can just sum it up in one word and it's vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I actually lacked the ability to, to be vulnerable and really ask for help when I was struggling because what I learned in sport and particularly being a distance swimmer and, and having that dominance for so long was one, any adversity I will overcome and I will actually, you know, get the outcome that I'm looking for if I'm sick, if I'm injured, if it's a difficult day. So surely I can do that in my personal life as well, right? I can take that attitude in there. Um, and I knew if I, if I persisted that I would eventually be okay. That doesn't necessarily work in your, your personal life. And the other aspect was people always looked up to me. So people were always asking me for help. Why would I ask anybody else for help? Because aren't I the person that everyone asks? Mm. So I had this complete um, lack of awareness around how I couldn't be vulnerable. I didn't even know I was like that until now. So I've learned this because at the time, otherwise I would have gone, well, that's what I'm doing wrong. That's my silver bullet there. I've actually got to change things. I've actually got to ask for help before I go down a path or a slippery, slippery slope that's going to put me in a really bad place mentally. And so, you know, going, going through a divorce, losing a lot of time with my, my 10 year old twins now, you know, the twins at that particular point in time, um, been branded this, that, and the other, and a, a whole heap of stuff in the media that was very untrue and very hurtful, mm. um, really put me in a bad place. And then this inability to be vulnerable about it and not actually address the issue mm. was, was so challenging. And, and now, even when I, I have bad days or things aren't going well, I actually talk about it. I actually talk about it with my fiance. I actually acknowledge it and I don't try and escape the feelings. I was always running away from those negative feelings because I was so used to pushing through them, then delivering the outcome and then everything was fine and that was okay. But I realized in your personal life and in, you know, mental health that you actually can't do that. The, the harder you run away, the more you white knuckle and clinch your fist and try and push through, the worse it actually grows. And that wasn't the case in sport. The more you push, the more you, the more you gave, the more you got. Mm. And so, and so you were this, um, you were this gladiator in sport, but you can't take that type of psychology into your personal life, particularly when, you know, my kids mean the absolute world to me and, and missing them put me in such a bad place. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with any of that. I didn't have the life skills to deal with any of that. So um, for me, embracing vulnerability, embracing those negative thoughts, embracing um, the fact that I'm going to have good and bad days is actually okay now. And it's actually made me a much more rounded person for going through all that personal adversity and you know, the mental health issues that I incurred post swimming. Um, because now I can actually reflect on things 
um, with, with a lot of learnings out of those, those moments that I went through and actually realize that if I'm going down the same pathway mentally, that I actually have the tools and ability and insights and self-awareness now around what my faults and weaknesses are. And I don't think I actually developed those attributes through swimming. And because swimming went so well, it actually stopped me from looking in the mirror too often around well, what are your true weaknesses? And I really didn't recognize those until post-sport and going through all of those challenges. And, you know, the biggest piece of advice I can pass across to anyone is, you know, when things are tough or challenging, ask for help. Don't necessarily use family the whole time. Use professional help. Um, get to understand, know yourself. And also the biggest thing for me was probably going overseas in, in 2017 and really taking some time out. I, I lived with Michael Phelps for a while and just getting out of the environment that I was really stuck in a rut in um, and really getting back to more of who I was, my own value set. And the thing, the problem with me too, when I went through that period, I was conflicted the whole time because you've got this, this personal value set that you have and a bunch of principles that you live by. And I, and I kept breaking those principles in many ways. So I was destabilizing myself as a person. And I think when I got out of that environment, got to understand myself, got that level of self-awareness, I really got back to the things that I cared about, the principles that I valued. And I became more of me again. And I felt so much better about everything. And it's really funny, ever since I've gone through that point, and this was probably five really challenging years, Life has gotten so much better, so much more rewarding. My relationships with people are so much stronger. So um, as much as I didn't want to go through any of those difficult times, they have actually made life so much more rounded and better now. And, and I think um, a lot of it, I realized that it's, it's all up to you. You've got to make the choice to want those things and to want to shift. Um, and then you've got to Again, like anything else, like being a 1500 meter swimmer, you've got to do the work to be able to, to make the shift and make, make progress. So yeah, there was, there was a lot I learned and I, and I think it's, um, it's made me a better person today. It's made me a better partner. It's made me a better father. Mm. Mate, I just want to kiss you on the face right now because what you just said is so powerful, so beautiful. Um, the, the person that I knew 15 years ago was not, was not ready to talk like that and, and probably didn't have that level of awareness at all. So to see you now is, is incredible and to hear you speak. There's so many uh, great lessons in there for people and, and that was such a beautiful way that you put it. You, you've always been very in, intelligent, but um, that, that was pretty incredible what you just talked about there. Uh, mate, how, how, was, uh, how did you develop a relationship with Michael Phelps and how did you become so close with him? Well, I've obviously known Michael for what, basically 20 years. So I, I, you know, I probably really first met him at 2001 World Championships in Fukuoka in Japan. Um, in 2003, he actually came over and tra trained with me for, for a bit. And we actually established a, a really strong relationship then. And I think that sort of formed the basis of the relationship that we have today. And um, we, we both love to work hard. We both love to push each other in training. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both focused on, on our goals. And we actually have very similar sense of humor. So we actually talk a lot of crap and just laugh at the same silly things. So mm -hmm. I think from a personality perspective, we, we, we just clicked and gelled. And um, always when we go to international meets, I always spend a bit of time with Michael. I'd always catch up with him. And, you know, when I went through those difficult times, he was, to his full credit, he was one of the first people to, to reach out. And, um, you know, he forced me to come and stay with him, um, mm -hmm. to spend time with him to get out of the bubble that I was living in Australia. And, and so he, he's just always been there as, as, as a mate. And he's mm -hmm. been through a lot of personal challenges himself. So he can very much relate um, in all of that. So I think our, our relationship was very strong whilst we were swimming. But I think it's become even much stronger um, post-swimming because of, you know, just what we've been through more generally in life. And I think I'm probably one of the more fortunate people that actually knows Michael for Michael. Because everyone mm -hmm. looks at Michael as a Way, you know the greatest Olympian of all time and yeah. most decorated swimmer of all time and you know he's still a human being at the end of the, at, at the end of the day and um, you to, to be able to connect with someone on that level they I don't think they actually are able to connect with too many people because everyone just looks at them as this certain ideal of a person um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate I think it's it's also healthy for him that we have that type of brotherly relationship where we can talk about anything and everything be completely vulnerable open and honest and share the same passion 
for the sport, for improving the sport, seeing it evolve and for performance. So um, I think the psychology is just very much aligned. And yeah, we just have a good time. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. Um, well, listen, I appreciate your time, man. I know it's early for you. I know you're at work and, and you're in, in the finance industry and you're, you're going to be successful at everything you do. There's, there's no doubt about that. But, um, man, I really appreciate this. And there's so many things we could talk about, but just the, the knowledge that you've shared today has been super powerful. I'm very thankful, mate. Thanks, Hawkey. And, um, mate, loved having the chat with you and I hope the podcast goes well. But um, And, mate, thank you for all your support over the years. I'm sure... People have probably more seen it, you in terms of your coaching, um, how supportive and genuine you are as a person and as an athlete. But um, you've been a phenomenal part of my life and my journey. And, and I'm very grateful for that. And I reflect a lot of my swimming career with moments with you, um, not necessarily the performances. So, so thank you for that. And I'm sure you're giving the same thing to people um, right now in terms of what you're doing. So, so thank you to you too, mate. Yeah, mate. Well, I appreciate you saying that. It means a lot to me. Thanks, mate. And uh, it's good to see your face again. We had a little reunion with the uh, with the 2000 Olympic team that the other day. That was that was a bit of fun as well, hey? That was funny. Didn't you feel like we just kind of picked up where we left oh, off? Like the totally. Same, banter, totally. same dynamic, same characters in there. Everyone just kind of went back into their normal roles. It was like we just, just got on the bus and yeah. that person was heckling that person. People were paying 500 <laughs> off the back of the bus and uh, like it was just hilarious it was actually I, I finished that call and i just felt awesome all afternoon on saturday it yeah. was just it was great yeah a great call we should do it more often i think that's probably one thing that you know you can thank the pandemic for is kind of just bringing people together again <laughs> you know so um that's a good thing it is. It, you know the, the one positive aspect of you know what the world is going through at the moment we're, we're connecting in different forums and different ways and things that we wouldn't have thought of before because we've always been so busy with life and everything that's going on so it's really nice that people are making this extra effort to connect um it's, it was yeah. it was really cool doing it. yeah it makes you realize human connection is important and and friends are important um family is important as well but um, you know, I, I consider you my family and I'm so glad I've reconnected again and, and I'm, I'm always here for you and, and I know you're always there for me. So mate, I, I, I love you to death and, um, I'm, I'm so glad to see you happy and healthy and your family's doing well, mate. Yeah. Thanks Hawkey and vice versa, mate. You know, all of that. Yeah, for sure. All right, buddy. Hey, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, you too. Thanks Hawkey. Cheers, bro. Cheers, mate.